So as Maggie has said, I'm going to speak in English just because I think my Spanish Portugal is not enough. So uh, actually, I don't really intend to show a lot of data here. I, I intend to show more of what we do and more of the kind of problems we have in Brazil. Um, I don't know how many people here, I know you don't, but how many people here work with fisheries? <laughs> Pretty much everybody here, not Anna. Uh, so, but you, are, you guys are used to one kind of fisheries and one kind of set of problems related to fisheries. You know when you, when you think of fisheries, you think of large boats, people that go uh, out of for a month and they come back with large catches, a lot of demersal catches. So I'm going to be talking about something much different. I'm going to be talking about things that can be as small as this, but they still respond for a, a lot of the catch in Brazil. So uh, I know that people tend to ignore small-scale fisheries, but they shouldn't be ignored because there are still uh, at least one of the estimates, it estimates that at there are at least 51 million fishers in the world most of them, 99%, are small. They are the little guys that come. I'm not, I'm not talking about subsistence. This is just one side of it. Most of it is actually commercial. This involves everything, commercial, subsistence, uh, recreational, but most of it is actually to end up in our plate and not in their plate. So they're important. Uh, and most of them are in developing countries, basically in the tropical developing countries. Uh, they respond at least for 45% of the catches of the world. Why do I say at least? Because most of their catches never make to the records. So because they are small, they are not computed in the, in the national statistics. What we do now to try to understand their relevance, <coughs> we are in a process that's called fisheries reconstruction that maybe some of you have heard because it's trying to reconstruct the whole fisheries, industrial and artisanal, and perhaps one day even the scientific sampling will be in that database too to know the impact that we have in the, in our, with our samplings. But with this kind of data, now we're having a better understanding of what's going on with the small scale fisheries as well. But even without that data, we already know that they respond for at least 45% of uh, the catch in the world. In Brazil, it's even more important they, uh, depending on the decade, like in the 60s, for example, they respond for 84%. But even in more recent estimates, in 2000, the last one is from 2011, it was still above 50% of all the catches. Like Brazil has a huge coast of over 8,000 kilometers, but it doesn't have a very significant um, fisheries. Like it's not among the top five, for example. Peru that's much smaller, is much more important than Brazil. But for what we have, small scale fisheries, is the most, still the most relevant. Uh, and since 2011, we've been guessing what fisheries, uh, what kind of fisheries are happening and what we're catching in Brazil, because with all the crisis that you know, you all heard of that, the political, the economic crisis, uh, one of the first things they, they cut was education, science, and anything related to fisheries and statistics. So we don't know anything anymore. What you're going to see what we are trying to do to get this information. So who is this guy here that I'm going to be talking about? They are not professional in general in the sense that they are only fish. They usually do a bunch of different things at the same time. So they are peasants, they are sailors, they are small vendors, they are construction workers, they can be gardeners, and they reconcile fisheries with everything else. When a thing is not doing well, they go to fisheries or the other way around. Um, they change their strategy just like the, the industrial one, according to currents, wind, waves, vegetation. Vegetation doesn't matter if you're talking about the ocean or the sea, but it's very important if you're talking about the Amazon, and I'm going to bring data from the Amazon here too, and with ecological cycle. I'm mostly talking about he because most of the fishermen, most of the fishers are actually fishermen, but we also have fisherwomen in Brazil. Um, they can be very engaged. I always joke that in the coast, for example, they are completely um, not organized. 
They don't know anything that's happening in, with their neighbor, with their next village. In the Amazon, I always joke that I have to, to get a boat and like go up the river for 600 kilometers. Sometimes it takes days to get there. When I get there, they know who I am. They know why I'm there. And they already have like, oh yeah, we are the fishermen here are waiting for you. They know everything and we don't know how because sometimes we have the fastest boat and there's no radio, but they are organized. So that changes a lot uh, the kind of strategies that I'll show you that they've been dealing to keep their fisheries uh, depending on where they are. You're going to see that in the Amazon they have a lot of things going on even though they are in the middle of nowhere while in the coast they have nothing basically going on. And it's a family business so they catch the women sell, clean the fish, prepare everything. The sons uh, work with them on the boat, or used to work, because one of the things that we've been identifying is that nobody wants their sons to be fishermen anymore. So that's like, uh, fishermen are looked down, people look at them and like they're poor, they're ignorant, so they don't want their sons to be in that same position. And we don't know because we see, we've been seeing, I've been working with fishermen for the last 12 years, I think, and I can see there are fewer and fewer fishermen, but still more and more fish get into the markets. So somebody is taking their niche, and even though they are small, there are companies now, they are taking the niche of the former small-scale fishermen. And we don't think that's going to be something positive. Um, so... We have over, now actually there is no estimate, but in 2000 we had over 250,000 fishers, small scale fishers only, that were associated. Their fishing uh, community, their fishing organization is called Colonia. And the, colo the colonies have this history, like they used to be slaves back in the day, like in 1903. Um, they were not necessarily black people that were former slaves that were turned into fishermen slaves. No. Whoever was a small-scale fisherman was treated by the government as a slave. They had to fish for the government for no pay. At some point, they rebelled against that, and they got the right to association uh, only at, with the Constitution after our dictatorship in, 18, uh, in 1988. So now they have, they can retire, for example, what a concept. Huh? They finally evolved to get retirement. And they have one thing that's uh, an ecological measure to support fish reproduction. So they have one salary, uh, one period of the year when they, get, when they get this extra salary that's called defeso, because it protects the fish reproduction. For up to three to six months, they are not allowed to fish, but they get a salary for not fishing. So we call that, it's a, it's a sort of payment for ecosystem service. And now they are mostly, they are almost uh, majorly urban fishermen. Like it's hard to imagine, I know some people have been to Rio, for example, it's hard to imagine that Copacabana, for example, have fishermen. Yeah, it does. Actually, Copacabana is the main fishing colony in Rio, in the city of Rio. They provide most of the groupers, the nice fish, like if it's not sardine, it's not, if it's not merluza, it's going to come from the small-scale fishermen that land in Copacabana. Or uh, Niterói, which is next to Rio, or in Natal, where, I'm where we, I live. I was going to say where I'm from, but I'm not from there. Um, this fishery is marked by high diversity of species, so uh, if I just go to one village, I'm going to be seeing over the course of a year between 50 to 100 fish, uh, fish species being landed by them. But they are also very specialists because they focus on fa in few species, 5 to 10, the ones that are more pricey. And of course, they are very adaptive. Um, for example, if you are in the Amazon, of course, we cannot adopt the same strategy when the water is low than when the water is high. And this is not actually a big difference. In some areas, it can be up to 15 meters. So they are completely inside the water. Different fish will be there. It will be harder. They'll have to use different techniques. So here I'm just showing that depending on the season, they'll focus on species that they can get. So in low water, what it means is that they can actually go for the fish they want because it's, more, uh, it's easier 
fish are in the lakes, for example. In the high water, in the Amazon, they, they'll get whatever they have to when they get something. Like I've been to areas where people were starving, like Blackwater River, uh, there's no nutrient in the water, so there's barely any fish. When there's a lot of water, the, fi the few fish that's there just spread out and they have, they have no fish. Like you're in the middle of the Amazon and you have no fish and it's natural. So like that's a regular catch. And because they are small, some people think they are doing well. And that's not true. It's not true for Brazil and it's not true for most places in the world. There is evidence of overfishing everywhere, including sites in the Amazon. Uh, this is a part of the work done by uh, Daniel Pauli around the world. So in, in his study in Brazil with one of his former students, he analyzed the decline of the trophic level. And for this is the northeastern coast. This is where I'm based. So for most of the area, there was uh, some evidence that the, the trophic level was declining all over, except for the state, the two states up here, including the one where I live, that seemed to be doing fine. But this was just the first analysis and what we are seeing now, Maria is helping us with this, with this new study, is that this is not really true. What happened here is that fishermen expanded their area to compensate for it. So they were not catching enough of a, given, of a given species. They expanded their fishing area. They are going farther and farther away and keeping the trophic level for now. So we still don't see the dec decline, but we see uh, evidence of overfishing in some areas. Um, and they, people also, the small scale fishermen also endanger uh, species that cannot undergo a strong fishing pressure. It's not like sardines, it's not like merluza. Some of these species they target are long-lived species or they, are, they switch sex after like groupers, for example, or snook. So they cannot undergo, even small fishing pressure can be very bad for them. And this is one emblematic case, the parrotfish. These are keystone species in reefs. They are very important for the reef. What I'm saying is that they are very important for the reef health. But uh, what we see is that in Brazil, they are going extinct in a lot of the sites because they were not important at first. People were not interested in them. They didn't have any value until the Americans decided that their filet was nice. Then all of a sudden, it started going extinct in different parts of Brazil. And this is another study that we did with support of Maria too, seeing the distribution of three of the endangered species in Brazil. So this is, Maria predicted that the area where they were supposed to be. Um, as a matter of fact, they do not occur here in the south anymore, or barely, but they are still pretty abundant where we are. And uh, Maria will say that this, the maps are not so nice because now she learned how to do better maps, but uh, I still like them. And for these two species, they are in a little better, the situation is a little better because they can occur offshore if there are islands or uh, rock crops. But this poor guy here, it's only coastal and from very shallow waters. This is a fish that go goes up to this, at least, if they let them. So we looked at the, the gears and what they were catching for each one of them. And for, for where we are, for where the region where we are, we saw that they are actually catching mature fish. So it seems to be doing okay for these species, the first pair of fish. For the second one, the same. Most of the catches are of mature fish. But these are the ones that actually have some extra area where they can go. The one that's in a, the most critical situation, people are already catching mostly immature fish. So based on this study that was done by one of our students, we recommended, uh, I didn't bring the recommendations here, but we recommended specific managed measures and now this is being taken into account for the parrotfish national plan. We know that if, if we lose this species, these species here, we are probably losing a lot of the diversity and the functions of the reefs in Brazil. Well, so one thing that we have learned over the, over the years is that 
The drivers of fishing and of fishing status are less of a biological issue than of a socioeconomical one. So when we talk about, like I was talking to Belido one of these days, uh, he was saying like, ah yeah, we know that. It's not about, we know a lot about the science of fish. We know a lot about the ecology of the, the, species, the species we, we want to manage. Now we have to manage. And why don't we? What's behind? What's preventing us from going one step further? And that's what we try to investigate too, even if it's a um, uh, small scale fishermen, we try to understand why it's so hard to apply what we know that should be done. Well, first of all, there are multiple conflicts of interest. Uh, there we have looked at a few of them. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be talking about two different kinds, infrastructure development and conservation. Now, conservation is all we want, but conservation doesn't really work if you don't involve the fishermen to be with you as a partner. And tourism too, but I'm going to skip tourism for now. When, we talk in a, when we are talking about infrastructure, we are talking about uh, different things, depending if you are on the coast or not. But if we're talking about the Amazon, this is the main issue, the implementation of giant dams. Like every year they propose a larger dam than the largest one in the world the year before. Ah, oh yeah, China had the biggest one, so now we have the biggest one. It, that goes on and on. And if we look at this study that was published last year by one of our colleagues, these are the, in, in, in red, you have the planned dams where they want to implement them. The white ones are the ones that are working. This is the Amazon basin. And this is the number of species that you find in each area. So the darker, the more species there. And some of them are endemic. Most of them are endemic, actually. So this is Brazil. So you can see like how many dams there are planning for Brazil, just for the Amazon. Luckily, the crisis stopped everything. That's when crisis are, that's there. They're good for one thing. <laughs> and this is what Peru, Colombia, Bolivia is doing your planning. So they have, they have fewer, but they have everything on the, on the heads of the rivers. So if they implement, and they are implementing everything, they are going to screw up the whole basin for us too. And I don't know why, but they like to put dams where the endemism is high, where there are lots of new species being discovered all the time. So that's one issue that we've been fighting. That we've, it's, sometimes it feels like we are more like, uh, engaged in fights against the government than doing science, because when you get to a more applied situation, things get really mixed up. Like you don't know if you're a scientist or like uh, an activist anymore. And this is, like, I brought this because this is so typical of Brazil. In 1989, they, pr they proposed this giant dam in the Amazon that was supposed to have an indigenous name, Cagarao. And the indigenous were so organized that they managed to stop, like we thought they, they were so organized that they managed to stop this dam. And this Indian woman became famous because she threatened the engineer with a big knife, and that was all over the news. So we thought this was dead. Then, 20 years later, the same project comes back, now remodeled, with some issues addressed, but now it's even, it was even larger. So the same woman went there with her knife. This time, she actually cut the face of the engineer, just slightly. <laughs> Nothing too bad, but she, they didn't manage to stop the dam. And now we have Belo Monte, the largest dam in the world that actually just works for three to four months and produces only 20% of what's supposed to produce. Because if you look at the plans, it will only work if we establish six more dams upstream the river. So that was the real plan the whole time, other than making the construction companies rich. So this actually inspired one movie that everybody knows about. Um, so we've been working, actually not with Belo Monte yet, because Belo Monte is, uh, uh, we are not the universe that's involved in addressing their issues, but we've been working with the different dams. And Tukurui used to be the second largest dam in the country until 
five, six years ago, and we've been studying the impacts of the kudui on the fisheries. Downstream, the dam, but downstream, like 50 to 100 kilometers downstream of the dam. And the impacts we see are huge, like people lost, this is what we're asking the fishermen to tell us, species that increased. So we do a lot of interviews, like I never said, the methods, we sample fish landings, we measure fish, but we also talk to the fishermen a lot. So we do a lot of interviews. So here we're asking them if uh, some fish actually increased after the dam. So they are really far away from the dams, right? But we can see their economic damage. We have the data on their income. And most of them will say none, but uh, some of them will say weak fish have increased. We, what we know is that all the fish that tolerate uh, still water have exploded. But this fish is not as pricey as the ones that they lost. They lost a lot of the species, they are fruit eaters. So these species, this fish, they actually eat fruit and they're responsible for the regeneration of the forest. So the fact that you build a dam, you screw up the salary and the livelihood of the people downstream, but you also screw up the forest itself because it cannot regenerate without the fish. Um, and the second kind of conflicts we see uh, is with conservation itself. As biologists, uh, our first, like I'm a biologist, as a biologist, my first, I was trained that conservation is something really good. We need to establish protected areas everywhere. And we get really happy when we see something like this, protected area. Each one of these is one kind of protected area. But this whole area here is, have, have been used by fishermen for hundreds and hundreds of years. So all of a sudden, they, dis they discover, because they are never informed, that one day they are just arrested by the environmental police or something like this, they, they cannot fish there. And they are forbidden for fish since the last 10 years, but they didn't know because nobody told them. And of course, they disrespect everything. So this is, uh, these are islands that were chosen to be uh, closed. They are marine, they are together they form a marine protected area. Nobody knows how they chose such areas, but we know, I, well, my group found out that these were historical areas for small-scale fishermen. They went exactly where the fishermen used to be. So, of course, there's a huge conflict. And that's making that the protected area is not really working. There is more fish outside the in the islands that are not protected than in the islands that are protected. And why is that? There are two main reasons, and the fishermen told me one thing. They chose the areas where fish do not reproduce. They close the areas where fish pass through, and that's why we would go there. They should be, the fishermen actually, we together, mapped a new proposition for the marine protected area. The fishermen said, this and this and this should be protected because these are reproduction sites. But they are not. And these are just where they pass through, this is where we should fish, because we're not gonna be catching juveniles there. So this is, this is still not happening. The, they did not consider our suggestion. In another marine protected area that I worked and finished the work last year, they are now reconsidering the proposition we did. We are not, like some people, when they see me talking, when I go to the protected, to the headquarters of the protected area and say, here is the plan that I devised together with the fishermen, together with the researchers, they say, Ah, oh, you want to end, you want to close the protected area, you want it to make it small. No, listen to me. We are actually proposing to make it larger. We are just proposing to change some sites because according to fishermen and according to research, they are not effective. Okay. And Maria started saying like, okay, uh, with South Africa, there's not enough data. So here we have absolutely no data for most of the case. So just for my state, which is tiny compared to the size of Brazilian states, we have over 100 fishing villages. So we don't know at all what's going on in these villages. In the Amazon, it's not, it's not even possible to count the number of people fishing there. And the government cut all the funding and all the money for doing statistics there. So we need alternatives. I said I was gonna talk about an invisible problem, but I forgot to say that we also need to talk about solutions. So we need alternatives. The first alternative is the one that we started doing, paying from our own pocket. 
that doesn't work. Because even if it's just like uh, 50 euros a month, it's coming from my salary, from the salary of my colleagues, so we share, and that's, uh, that's enough to sample one village. And that's nothing. But we did that for over two years. When Maria was there, we were paying for, to get data from one village. We were paying for the students to go to the field and we were paying people there to help the students. We, we did well because we got three papers published <laughs> out of this. <laughs> but we cannot get information on things like that. Uh, so we were, at this point, we were sampling two villages on the coast and two villages in the countryside. So we've been trying to devise a better alternative uh, by talking to fishers to get accurate information from them. And we've been trying to compare the kind of information, what we can trust, because there's this myth that fishermen always lie. And different studies have been showing that they don't always lie. They can tell the truth. And sometimes they lie, but it's not to increase, it's not like, the fish was bigger than what they actually caught. There's one study that showed that if you ask the whole, f the whole village what they are lying about, they are actually, uh, the ones that catch the larger fish tell you they caught a smaller one. The ones that catch small ones tell you they caught the larger ones. So they, they give you the average. So <laughs> that's pretty good for us, you know, it works for some basic stuff. So with fishermen information, first we started getting like, okay, let's try to get their traffic chain uh, with what they are saying and see if this is in accordance with the literature. They are basic, but yeah, they were very similar to what we were getting. And then uh, Anne Elena, she came here, she was here with uh, Maria last year and some of you met her. She actually modeled the, the, the information she got from the fishermen with EcoPath and she got uh, models that were not as refined as the scientific ones, but they were very informative and very similar to the scientific ones. They, fishermen don't know, for example, to get to uh, growth rates. They cannot say, ah, this fish will grow this much in a year. They don't know this information, but they, they bring you a lot of new information that we can use. Another thing that we've been doing is training fishermen to sample their own landing. And this is working the best so far, but we need money to do that too, but it's much cheaper than counting on the government. So in the last two years, we sampled 12 villages in the Amazon, one village in the also in the countryside at the same time that we were sampling with our pocket money. And, and that's like an additional difficulty because you are dealing with people that are illiterate. They don't know how to read and write. So how you get them to get the information you need? So we have to be creative. We have to uh, make things like, we don't use, the words are just for our control. The fishermen themselves, they don't know what's written here. They just put crosses. Okay, this was the guy who fished. He fished this, this much kilo, this much money, this day what he used. So we get a full fishy, uh, fishing landing from somebody that don't know how to read. So in this case, this guy here was helping us. Uh, he was a genius that didn't know how to write and read. But this, when I got there, ah, oh, you want information on the fish? Hold on, he knew numbers. He came back with two piles of notebooks. He said, this is everything I fished in the last 10 years. But it was just numbers. So no dates, no fish, nothing. But he wanted to register his catches. So he got happy when we asked him to do that. And we compared, he alone uh, sampled over a thousand fish landing. Two researchers in two villages together sampled 600 fish landing. So he was way more effective than our students. This is another example with uh, octopus. Uh, so we first started saying, okay, we just want to know when they are fishing just so we can develop our research. We are going to set, we are going to set some, uh, NASA, NASA? We are going to set some, some NASA's there. We need to know how they worked. Um, and after we discover that, we need to get estimates on their catches. And again, we are using, uh, 
pictures to get this information, and this was very useful. Uh, this the first paper is actually coming out right now, so there's still a lot, a lot to do. And we've been trying to do things more participatory. So these are the few fisher women that we have. They are clam gatherers, clam, clam harvesters that also don't know how to read and write. Well, the part in Brazil where I am is the, mo the most poor part of the country. So it's common to find a lot of illiterate people. So they actually did this themselves. They drew the area to mark the, the fishing ground and all this stuff. We also have over a thousand uh, information on that. And we could get information on their value chain just with their support. Okay, so th what's the next step? What can we do to get this information and to make fisheries actually better? So what we are trying to do is something that I call inclusive conservation. Conservation shouldn't be for researchers, for environmental agencies, or for the public that want to visit or that like uh, protected areas. They should be for everybody, including for the users. So Brazil has these three categories of uh, protected areas that actually allow the use of resources there as long as it's done sustainably. Sustainable development reserves is actually for extractive reserves, fishing agreements, completely different than what you guys know as a fishing agreement, and something that's not official, but it's spreading like crazy in the Amazon, that's called community-based management. They decide on the managed plan without the government knowing, and they start managing their fisheries, and the government never hear about that. But they were, they were, before they were doing nothing on their own, okay, we are losing the fish, let's do something about it. So these initiatives, these are the, the two first categories. They are spread all over the coast, but they are mostly concentrated in the Amazon. And they started with this reserve here in the Amazon. Mamigawa is the most famous reserve in Brazil. It's visited by a lot of foreigners who want to go visit the Amazon because they have an ecotourism uh, infrastructure. And the reserve, uh, was established first to protect one endemic species of monkey. And the fishermen would be expelled, 52 communities would be expelled from the reserve. And I said before, they are organizing, they said nobody's gonna take us from here. 52 communities, it's over a thousand people. And they said, and we don't care about the monkey, otherwise the monkey wouldn't be here, we don't need it. So if you want to protect the monkey, you can do it. Like, we don't care about it. So after a, a big fight, they came up with this suggestion, okay, let's have a protected area where people can live and they have to help us manage the resources there. And once they started studying the reserve, they found out that this reserve was actually very rich in this species here, which was gone extinct in most of the Amazon. So there was this question, why is it so abundant here? So if you want to have a better idea, this is the largest fish, uh, scale fish in the world. Uh, so why is it so common here why, where everybody else is gone? The Portuguese, we can start blaming the Portuguese first. The Portuguese actually came, when they came to Brazil 500 years ago, they caught this fish because they call it the, the freshwater cod because once you salt, everything tastes the same, and they, they said, okay, it works as caught for us. So they were the ones who started uh, uh, extinguishing the, the fish in different areas. So what happened here was actually that uh, years before the reserve came, there was a conflict between industrial freshwater fisheries, there is this in the Amazon, and these people living in the reserve. They started fishing that, that catching fish from their lakes, and they started starving. They didn't have enough fish. So after a big fight, the Catholic Church, like a leftist branch of the Catholic Church was in this area, and they organized the fishermen and say like, we should do some sort of management without using these words. So this is like a, a main area, like a, a larger lakes, and these are all oxbow lakes. So they are separated in the, in the dry season, and they all join together in the high water season. So the Catholic Church established a system with five different categories of lakes. 
Some were only for subsistence, while others were for emergency, others were for selling, others would allow people to come from the outside, and others were for conservation. They shouldn't touch that. And every five years, they rotate that system. So that's why they still had fish. So it was very easy for the reserve. They can do that. They would just keep their system. They simplified the system. Now you have lakes that can be visited by the outsiders, lakes where they can fish for themselves and to sell in areas where they cannot touch at all. And the results of this kind of management, the method has actually been uh, made scientific because I forgot to say, but this is a air breather fish. It has to come outside, it has to put the head outside the water to breathe. And because it does that, the fishermen learn how to count and estimate the number of fish in each lake. So when the government said, you cannot fish a species that's going extinct, even if it's very abundant here, they said, well, but we can actually tell you how many fish there are in each lake, and then you can decide. And the government said, well, we don't believe you. So they did an experiment with mark recapture and with fishermen counting the fish in different lakes. And the difference between the two methods was only 3% in the numbers they estimate, but one was 200 times cheaper, 2,000 times faster, the fisherman's method. So now it, they standardi standardized, and this is the official method to count this fish. It's called Piradocu. It's the official method to count Piradocu in all over the Amazon and not only in Brazil. So the fishermen from this reserve goes to other countries teaching the others how to count the fish and then they have a quota to tell how many fish they can catch in the next year. So uh, in one of the few studies, after a few years of implementing the management, what they saw was an increase in the number of piradocu, large piradocu over a meter per hectare along the years. Despite the fact that the fishing quota was increasing, increasing and despite the fact that income of uh, per fish was increasing and with new fishermen entering the system. So that seems perfect. There are new fishermen, it's not like we are reducing the number of them, they are getting paid more and there's more fish. So the system seems to work perfectly, great. So you think that, okay, we can forget about this. But then in another study, we found out that the fishermen were actually lying, um, not everywhere. It was working, but once they got so excited because the fish is actually, they don't have middlemen, the reserve sets all the sale between the fishermen and the next, like, they have middlemen, but not so many anymore. So they were paying, they were getting paid a lot of money. So they said, well, we can make more money if we say that there are more, more fish because then our quota will be higher. But they forgot to make, like, the right calculations and they, at some point, they were counting two fish per second which my student, <laughs> Lorena, found out and said, okay, you guys. And she came to a meeting with them and she said, so this is what's happening in this village here. You are counting, uh, so in their total, they counted 16, uh, over 1,600 piragucus, while the audition, which were other fishermen from other villages, counted half of that. So this is what's happening, and they can tell by the, each fisherman what they counted. Some people here are counting two to three fish per second. So what's going on here? And they said, uh, not the fishermen that did that, the others, that we are lying. Okay, so what should happen next? Now that you t were telling me that you're lying, we should lose our quota for the next year. They proposed that themselves. So they punished the whole village in the name of two or three fishermen that were lying. That way, they embarrassed the, the fishermen and they, it seems to be working so far. But that reminds us that we can never leave them alone. Like, they need some sort of, uh, you need a checking system to see when people can actually manage uh, a system for themselves. And then this is the other alternative that's spreading throughout the Amazon, that the community-based management. That's a strategy where it's not a reserve. They just decide to manage fisheries on their own. And in this study, that's, uh, it's underway, it's preliminary. We are now covering 1,200 kilometers of the river. So these are the first 600 kilometers of the river. 
We are comparing communities in protected areas with, with communities outside protected areas, but who are managing fisheries on their own. They manage fisheries and they manage beaches too. Why they manage beaches? Because they love to eat turtle and turtle eggs, and they lay the eggs on the beaches. So uh, what we saw is that, so these are, I said, are the preliminary results. What we saw is that regardless if it's inside a protected area or, uh, or inside a CBM, if the lake is protected, if the lake is here, there is no fishing, you have a lot more piragucus. We are looking at the same fish because this is like an indicator for us. Subsystem too, but if it's an open access lake, nobody's taking care of it, it doesn't matter where it is. It's not gonna have enough fish. If we join the managing subsistence and compare with the protected areas, then we see that it takes about seven and a half and 14 years for this fish to recover after you establish some management initiative. So it's actually fast. You can get a lot of fish really fast. Uh, in our model, we saw that lake protection is what explains most of the increase in Piragucu, regardless of, the, of the, status, the status being official in a protected area or being inside a community-based management. What people have is to watch over the lake, then they can have this increase. So persistence too. And with turtles, the same thing. What they saw on the beaches, as the beaches that are protected, uh, only 2% of predation rate of the turtle eggs. If they are not protected, 99% of predation rate, regardless if they are inside a protected area or not. Well, to end this part, the most interesting thing that we found out is that it, uh, once you protect the lake and once you protect the, the, the beach, you are protecting the lake for the piragucu and the beach for the turtles. You get positive results for everything else. So continental migrant birds increased, uh, other birds, catfish, terrestrial invertebrates, caiman, uh, and aquatic fauna. So it's like an umbrella type of conservation. You are going after one thing and you get positive results for everything. More than that, it's, uh, it's bringing results for the people too. If they are inside a protected area or community-based management, they have a better house. They have better stuff in their house. They have better income. So the protection management is actually giving them more money and more access to infrastructure too. When they are protected, inside protected areas, they have more access to school, health, bathroom, which they didn't have before, and basic stuff like that. So that's what we are using to convince them, okay, you don't want to be inside a protected area, adopt a community-based management and you're going to do better than just logging the trees. But to do that, and then I'm going to end uh, in two slides, I think, to do that, you have to understand what make people actually respect the rules they establish, because as I said before, they break the rules, right? When they are not being watched, they break the rules. And what make them endure hardships? So one of the things that we said, we, worked, we did interviews working with uh, scenarios. We would ask the fishermen, for example, uh, it's not allowed here to fish with gill net this size, this mesh size. Would you still use that forbidden gear if you were fined 100 euros? If you went to jail for one day, one week, one year? If your friends stopped talking to you? If uh, your family stopped talking to you? So we, st we worked with low punishment, high punishment and social punishment to see what they would answer. And the first idea that we had was, they'll lie, they'll just say anything you want to hear. They'll say, yes, yes, I won't break the rule, I won't break the rule. And regardless of what, uh, of what we did, we saw, these are also very basic statistics for people that are talking about hierarchical Bayesian analysis. <laughs> but what we saw is that regardless of the scenario we used, people were, uh, if they needed money and if they were old, they would say they would break the rules. 
So we knew people, we, based on other interviews, we already knew who were the most poor ones there. And those were the ones who said, I can go to jail for a year, I don't care. They can, ca they can take away everything that I have, I'll still fish because I don't have anything else to do. I, I'll either do that or I'm gonna starve, so I'm gonna take the risk. So that's one thing. So if you're gonna de devise management strategy, you should know the people, the group of people that you have to address to make it work. And that's the second type of uh, approach that we can do. Like who can actually undergo changes? What's, what kind of change? Establishing a protected area, climate change, whatever. Who can actually undergo changes without collapsing? Who are the group of people that can do that? So there is a whole approach in, uh, in social ecology that's called the resilience approach, where we try to understand who are the most vulnerable people. And again, we've been fine now. Now Maria is helping us with more advanced models. But the results actually are the same, regardless of the models we use. If people are very selective, if they just know how to fish, if they just know how to fish one kind of gear, uh, they collapse. They cannot undergo change. So we also, we are learning, this is the basic, there are more things we are finding out. So we are also, and if they are young too, they, they can, they, the young ones are open to change professions, to learn new things. The old ones, there's actually a, an age uh, that's like the most critical one, between 50 and 60. It's when like, they don't feel they can learn anything else, but they're not too old to retire. So these are the potential criminals in a fishing society. So we have to work specifically with this kind of people too. Yes, that's it. Thank you. I'm sorry if I went a little too long. These are my helpers. <laughs> que son mayoritariamente migrantes de Nicaragua que tienen un nivel eh, de renta más bajo que durante casi seis meses al año están trabajando en caña de azúcar mm. en la cosecha de caña cuando acaban la, los seis meses de cosecha de caña van a la costa y arrancan con todo, todo lo que pueden mm, recoger ostiones, muchos moluscos, crustáceos, algunos peces esos recursos no tienen manera de gestionarse de ninguna manera porque, claro, es una población que necesita a corto plazo, que no depende de ese recurso, que vive de otro y que y, y esos accesos hacen que ese tipo de recursos sean inmanejables, con grandes problemas de sobreexplotación, un grupo social tremendamente complicado de, de trabajar con ellos. En cambio, las comunidades pesqueras en El Salvador, por ejemplo, que tienen embarcaciones que van, se alejan algo de la costa, que ya, ya son comunidades con un acceso más restringido dentro de la comunidad de recurso, establecen reservas, tienen autorregulación, son, uh -huh. tienen un manejo más, más conservativo de los recursos. Por tanto, el, el tipo de comunidad y el tipo de, claro, en, en, particularmente en países en vías de desarrollo, cuando hay una crisis económica, una sequía un, y se, esos desplazamientos uh -huh. de población a pescar cualquier cosa, Claro, eso es inmanejable desde el punto de vista de sostenibilidad de los recursos. Y, pero, y sí que es cierto que cuando tienes comunidades que ellos pueden auto, autorregular el acceso, autorregular su recurso, eh, realmente es, ellos se autoimponen las reservas, ellos autoimponen las limitaciones, los, los, los ciclos de explotación, porque el conocimiento tradicional es muy importante. ¿no? Sí. Entonces, eh, nada, me, me ha encantado tu charla. Y, no, gracias. <laughs> yeah, we are trying, there's a research in America and a Mexican one who are trying to understand why some communities can actually develop this system. Why, what, what's the trigger that makes them okay, like things are going bad 
we have to take care because others we see that everywhere things end they disappear and they don't realize the fish is gone what I makes some I people I see I and others not if they could expand and could go to look for other res resources in other zones, but when they are in a lake that they explore this lake or uh, they exploit one reef, this means that the mobility is really important for to understand the the uh, uh, la la resistencia de la de la, la, la sensibilidad de las comunidades a la, a la explotación. E as coisas são muito dinâmicas. Em uh, Ama Amazon, por exemplo, eu was seeing that we are seeing something terrible now. The so first there was you have you had the the indigenous religion. Then the Catholics came and catechized everybody. I don't know if that's the word, but anyways. And uh, but then for some it was actually luck. They got a, like a more progressive branch of the Catholic Church with, where they care about the resource. But now the evangelicals are coming and they are very, very um, traditional in their ways. Like God will provide everything. So management is not important anymore. So we are beginning to see something terrible like some management initiatives actually collapsing because of religion. And you go talk to them and they say, Oh, no, no, the fish is not gone. It just went somewhere else, but it'll come back. Because that's the law of God. So, like, you, you have to be prepared for things changing the whole time. And, like, I don't know how to deal with religion. Yeah, I guess nobody knows. <laughs>